Today's video covers matrices. So this section is titled Matrix Review. Some of this may review be review. Some of this, though, is likely going to be new. You'll see that this video is long because there's a lot for us to talk about. So before we actually do the review, I want to make sure we know what's coming up in the video. So in terms of objectives for this unit, this video is going to talk about basic matrix matrix operations like addition, multiplication, determinants, and inverses. And then also we're going to be looking at Gaussian and Gauss-Jordan elimination to find eigenvalues and eigenvectors. That's something that may be new for some of us. Um, and then ultimately what we'll be going on to in the future is all of this is leading us to systems of differential equations. But that'll be in the next video. Now, if you're one of my students in class, you're gonna be watching this whole video. If you're just here though to review some matrices, you might need to just skip around in the video to find what you need to review and go over. So let's get started with the background to matrices. Some things that hopefully you remember. First of all is how to find the dimensions of a matrix. It's always the number of rows by the number of columns. Next thing that we need to talk about is when are matrices equal? Matrices are equal if they have the same dimensions and the corresponding elements are equal. And then next is basic operations with matrices. Adding and subtracting matrices the two matrices have to have the same dimension. If we multiply by a constant, that multiplies by all of the elements. And then when we multiply matrices, if we remember, like taking a three by two matrix and multiplying it by two by one, those inner numbers have to match, and then our product will be the outside. Now, if you need to review that, you're gonna to need to ask me because I don't wanna do that in this video. So some other important things that you may have seen, you may not. The first one is the multiplicative identity. Multiplicative identity is a matrix I such that if we take I and multiply it by some matrix, we're going to get that matrix. Same thing if we did A times I. So I is going to be a matrix such that we have 1 on the diagonals and 0 everywhere else. So a whole bunch of zeros. So this is an N by N matrix. So like we can see, if we take that matrix, this matrix right here, and we multiply it by any matrix, we're gonna get that matrix back. Now we also have the zero matrix, which is the additive identity. And that just says if we take A and we add a matrix that has a whole bunch of zeros in it, we're gonna get matrix A back. And that should make sense. We take a matrix that we're adding, hence the additive part. Identity just means that we get that matrix back. Next is the associative law. If we take A and multiply it by the product of B and C, that's the same as doing the product of A and B first and then multiplying by C. Of course, this is if the product exists. One thing I forgot to remind us of above when we were talking about multiplying, so up here, I wanna remind us that matrices A times B it's not necessarily the same as B times A, right? So if we take these two matrices and we were to multiply them in the reverse order, so we did the two by one first and then the three by two, we would see that that would not be possible. So just wanted to remind us of that. Okay, some more things. If we talk about the distributive law, if I have A multiplied by the sum of B and C, that's the same as AB add AC. Now, what I want us to remind us of from in red, that is not the same though as BA add CA. And in uh, math terms, what that's saying is that multiplication is not commutative. Likewise, if we do the sum first and then we multiply by A, that's the same as B, A, add C, A. Next thing, determinant of a matrix. We looked at these a little bit in Calc 3 when we were finding cross products. One thing to remind us of is that we can only find the determinant 
of square matrices. And last thing, when you are transposing a matrix, so let's say that we have some matrix A, where we have A of 1, 1, A of 1, 2, all the way to A of 1, N. This is A of 2, 1, all the way down to A of M, 1, and this will be all the way down to A of M, N. If we take the transpose of this matrix, before we look at the transpose, let's consider the dimensions. This matrix A is M by N. When we transpose, we're going to get a matrix that's N by M, and we're just switching the rows and columns. So this first column is going to become the first row. So I'm going to have A of 1, 1, A of 2, 1, all the way up to A of M, 1. Then I'll have A of 1, 2, all the way to A of 1, N. And A of M, N is still here. So putting that in simple terms, when we say transpose the matrix, what we are doing is switching the rows and columns. So we're going to take a look at one quick example, and then we'll go through some more review. So we have, if we have this matrix A right here, so we notice that this is a 3 by 2 matrix, the transpose of A then is going to be 2 by 3. So all we're doing is this first uh, column becomes our first row, and then we have our second. So let's keep reviewing. Next thing I want to talk about is a multiplicative inverse. So first thing is we are going to start with a square matrix. So let's A be a square matrix. If there exists another square matrix B, such that when we multiply A and B in either direction or either order, we get I, then we say that B is the multiplicative inverse of A. And the way that we write that is B is the inverse of A. And again, all that means is when we multiply them, we're going to get the identity matrix. And that's the one from the previous page where we have ones on the diagonals and zero everything else, everywhere else. Okay, so going on to a definition, if A is a square matrix and the determinant of A is not zero, then we say that A is non-singular. On the other hand, if the determinant of A is zero, then you can probably guess A is singular. And so, of course, uh, the question is, why do we care if A is non-singular or singular? Well, this is the big point here. That square matrix has an inverse if and only if the matrix is non-singular. So, of course, that's going to lead us to how do we actually find the multiplicative inverse. So, let A be an n by n matrix and let it be non-singular. And so, of course, non-singular meaning that the determinant is not zero. Then C, so C just being an element, is equal to this, where M is the determinant of the n minus 1 by n minus 1 matrix that's obtained by deleting the ith row and the jth column from A. So then our inverse is 1 over the determinant of A times those C of i, j, Elements that are obtained from M, the transpose, though. Okay, so I'm going to be honest. I think we look at this and go, huh? And uh, that's the same thing for me. I look at this and also go, huh? Uh, so I think it's just easiest to, to look at an example. So we have this example A, which is just a general example. Okay, so if we're finding the inverse of A... The first thing is we're going to have 1 over the determinant of A. And then obviously we know that we're going to have another 2 by 2 matrix. The question is, how do we find each of these elements? Okay, so here's the idea. For this first element, I'm going to delete the first row and the first column. And what I'm left with is A of 2, 2. That goes there. For this second element, I'm going to delete that row, that column. So what's left is A of 2, 1. Likewise, I would end up with 
a of 1, 2, and a of 1, 1. Now, to figure out the signs, if we have negative or positive, this first element is negative 1 to the first row, first column. So it'll be positive. This element is negative 1 to the first row, second column. So that'll be a negative. This one, negative 1 to the second row, first column. So also negative. This will be positive. We are not finished yet because we still have to do the transpose of that matrix. So almost done. Now we get the inverse of a, or the multiplicative inverse, is 1 over the determinant of a. And now this first row, first column rather, will become my first row. Second column will become the second row. So this is our determinant, this is our inverse, rather, of matrix A. Now, that's the general idea. That was for a two by two matrix, though. So in a case where you have a three by three matrix, when you delete a row and a column, you're not gonna be left with an element, you'll be left with a two by two matrix, in which case you're gonna have to find the determinant of that two by two matrix. You are not to just memorize this formula. You should know the process and be able to apply it to a matrix of any size. Uh, in our class, you will not be using a calculator for this. So please don't just assume that you can plug it into the calculator and let the calculator find the multiplicative inverse for you. Okay, so now that we have done one general process, we're going to do another 2 by 2, and then we're going to do a 3 by 3 matrix. Okay, so for this 2 by 2 in example 3, I'm going to start with finding the determinant of A. So if I do the determinant of A, if you remember, I'm going to multiply the first diagonal and get 5, and I'm going to subtract the second diagonal, which is 8, so I get a determinant of negative 3. So my multiplicative inverse then is going to be negative 1 third. So again, for my four elements, I'm going to delete, delete, so I have a 5 here, and then if I delete, delete, I'm going to get a 2, and then I'm just going to change colors. If I delete, delete, I'm going to get a 4, and if I delete, delete, I'm going to get a 1. And then figuring out our signs, we know that this one will be negative and this one will be negative. Again, because in this case, I'm doing negative 1, second row, first column. In this case, though, I'm doing negative 1, second row, second column. And then lastly, we need to transpose all of that. And so we get our multiplicative inverse. I'm not going to multiply the negative one-third in because most of those, well, none of those numbers are divisible by three evenly. So I get five, negative two, and then negative four, one. Now, if I asked you to verify that this is in fact the inverse, what you would do is you would take A, you would multiply it by the matrix that we just found, and you should get the identity. Of course, you would have to make sure you multiply the other direction as well, since multiplication is not commutative. But either direction, you should end up with the identity. Okay, so now let's get into what is certainly going to be a more complicated example, and that is finding the multiplicative inverse for a 3 by 3 matrix. So of course, we're going to need to start with the determinant of A. For the determinant of A, which remember can also be written like this, we're going to need to start with one row or one column. What I'm going to notice is this matrix has a zero here. So I'm going to start with this column right here. So if you remember, we're going to take the one, and then we delete the row and the column that one is in, and multiply by the determinant of the matrix that's left. I then have a zero. If you remember, though, whatever term you go to next, you would switch the sign. So it doesn't matter there times some matrix, which I don't care about because I'm going to get zero. And then I have a negative one. For the negative one, I have to picture deleting that same column, but the last row, and then I have the determinant of the matrix that's left. Okay, so if I keep going, this would give me 20 subtract negative two. And then I'm adding negative one times three subtract eight which gives us a determinant of 27. Okay, so that's just the determinant part. Since I've already written a whole bunch on my figure, I'm going to do some erasing so that I 
have myself some more room. Okay, so then what I'm looking at, my multiplicative inverse is going to be 1 over 27, and I'm going to have a 3 by 3 matrix that I'm then going to have to transpose. Okay, so if I start with this first term, I'm going to de delete the row and the column that it's in. And then I'm going to find the determinant of the matrix that's left. So I get negative 1 subtract 0, which is negative 1. And if I look here, I have negative 1 to the 1 plus 1 power. So my sign stays the same. If I look at this next one, I'm going to de delete the row and the column that that is in. So then I would get negative 4 subtract 0, which is negative 4. So I have negative 1 then to the power first row second column, which would give me a negative 1. So I have to switch the sign there. And I'm going to do one more. So this last term here, I'm deleting the column and the row that that one's in. So then I'm going to get this matrix right here. So I would get 20 subtract negative 2, which is 22. I would do negative 1 to the first row third column. So my signs stay the same. I'm not going to show the rest of them. You can go through the rest of the terms if you would like to. It ends up being negative 7, negative 1, negative 19, negative 1, negative 4, positive 4 rather, and negative 5. And then don't forget we still have to transpose. So finally, after all of that, we end up with our multiplicative inverse being 1 over 27 multiplied into the matrix negative 1, 7, negative 1, 4, negative 1, 4, 22, negative 19, and negative 5. And then remember, if we were to deal with this constant, it would multiply into all of those terms. So it's a tedious process, that is for sure. What we're going to go on to now is we're going to do some quick chatting about the calculus of matrices, and then we will move on to our next objective. So in terms of calculus of matrices, like finding the derivative or finding the integral, it's exactly what you think it would be. So taking a look at this example number five, we have x of t is these three functions in a matrix. We're finding the derivative, and then we're taking an integral. So if we want x prime of t, all we are doing is we're taking the derivative with respect to t of that first function. And we're taking the derivative with respect to t of the second function. And we're taking the derivative with respect to t of the third function. So x prime of t in this case, if we take all of those derivatives, it's going to be negative 15 sine of 5t, 14t, and 4e to the 4t. Likewise, if we take the integral from 0 to t of x of s ds, we're taking the integral from 0 to t of 3 cosine of 5 s ds, the integral from 0 to t of 7 s squared subtract 1 ds, and the integral from 0 to t of e to the 4 s ds, which tells us then that the integral from 0 to t of x of s ds, if we integrate each of those, we're going to get 3 over 5 sine of 5t, 7 over 3 t cubed subtract t, and 1 fourth e to the 4t. Okay, now that we've gotten through a lot of that, what you have probably done in the past is you've solved systems using matrices. And I'm guessing, at least for my students, when you've done this, you've done this mainly on the calculator. What we're going to be doing today, or in this next part of the video, is we're going to talk about how do you solve a system using a matrix by hand. So we're not going to be doing the calculator. Um, we're going to be doing the same type of process that the calculator does. So you're getting a peek behind the curtain at what the calculator is doing to actually solve the system. So a background that we need to know is what is called an augmented matrix. So here's an example. 
we have a of 1, 1, a of 1, 2, all the way up to a of 1, n. And then we have uh, n rows, so n rows and n columns. What we do is we augment then with this column matrix of b1 to bn. So this is written as a is augmented with b, and b in this case is a column matrix. So this is what you've seen when you've put a system into a matrix and then put it into your calculator. So just a quick example of what you did. Maybe you did 2x subtract y is equal to 7 and x add 3y is equal to 10. When you've put it in your, in, into a matrix, you've done 2, negative 1, 7, 1, 3, 10. So this is an augmented matrix. You've already seen this. And this is the matrix that you would put into your calculator to solve the system. So then when you have that augmented matrix, you're allowed to do elementary row operations to solve the system. There are three of them. You can multiply a row by a non-zero constant. You are also allowed to interchange rows. And last elementary row operation is to add non-zero constant multiples of one row to another. And so what we do is we use these elementary row operations until we have an augmented matrix in what we call row echelon form. And so the way that we're going to do that is first we're going to use this process called Gaussian elimination. So when we use Gaussian elimination, we're going to get a matrix in row echelon form, which has three things that are true about it. The matrix we're going to end up with, first of all, has the first non-zero entry in a non-zero row has to be 1. Also in this matrix, in consecutive non-zero rows, the first entry, 1, in the lower row has to appear to the right of the first one in the higher row. And lastly, all zero rows are at the bottom of the matrix. OK, so let's take a look at an example of what I'm talking about. The first non-zero entry in a row is 1. So I can have a 1 here, and then I have some other numbers that don't matter, and I'm augmented with some things. In consecutive rows, the first entry, which again has to be 1, has to be the right to the right of the 1 in the higher row. So because there's a 1 here in my next row, the 1 has to be to the right of it. So I could have a 1 here. Everything before that has to be a 0. And then I have some number here, so maybe I have a 0. And then, if I have a zero row, it's going to be at the bottom of the matrix. So this is called row echelon form. And we used Gaussian to get here. Now, you're going to be asking, what is Gaussian? Well, we're going to get to that in a minute. But that's the idea. Now, you may have noticed from the objectives that there's Gaussian elimination and there's also Gauss-Jordan Jordan, rather, elimination. So what we could do is we could take one more step and we could keep going until each column 
has a 1 and zeros elsewhere. So when we do that, that's what we call the Gauss-Jordan method. So looking at an example of the Gauss-Jordan method, which gives us what we call reduced row echelon form, and that's what you've probably seen on your calculator before when you've done this reduced row echelon form. So the Gauss-Jordan method is going to end up with the matrix. On the left side, it's going to be the identity. One's on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. And then we have our augmented piece. So this matrix is in reduced row echelon form, and we used Gauss-Jordan to get here. Okay, so of course we're going to need some practice actually doing this. So we're going to take a look at example 6, which we're going to solve using the Gaussian method and also the Gauss-Jordan method. Okay, so I'm not going to lie to you, this is a beast of a process. So just, you're going to have to stick with it. Uh, there's going to be quite a few steps, and just know that we need to be very careful because any mistake that we make early on is really going to uh, hurt us. First thing we do is let's make our augmented matrix. So we're just taking our coefficients, and we are augmenting with our solutions. Okay, ultimately what we're looking for as a reminder with Gaussian is we want one here, one, one, zeros, and maybe zeros in the last row if we can. So we're allowed to do three things. We can switch rows, we can multiply by constants, and we can add constant multiples of one row to another. The first thing that I notice that's really convenient is I have a one here. Well, it would be more helpful if the one was in the first row. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch rows one and two. I would highly suggest that you write notes as to what you're doing so that if you make a mistake, you can easily backtrack. Okay, so what I'm doing then is my first row is now one, two, negative one, negative one, and then I have two, six, one, seven, and then five, seven, negative four, and nine. Okay, so thinking now, I'm happy with the one that I have here. What I need is I need a zero here and I need zeros here. So first column is going to, not first column, first row will stay the same. So all I'm going to do is just recopy the first row because I know that I'm happy with it and I don't need to do anything there. Okay, so in order to get this 2 to be a 0, what I can do is I can multiply that first row by negative 2 and add it to the second row. So if I do that, I would get a 0 here. I'm multiplying this by negative 2 and adding it to 6, so I get 2. I'm multiplying by negative 2 and adding it here, so I get 3. I'm multiplying by negative 2, adding it here, so I get 9. Okay, similar idea. If I want a 0 here where there's a 5, I can multiply that first row by negative 5 and add it to the third row, which would give me a 0. Again, I'm multiplying by negative 5 and adding it here which would give me negative 3, multiplying by negative 5 and adding it here, which would give me 1, and then this will give me 14. Okay, so we said we needed a 0 here too, but I'm not ready for that yet. Now that I have zeros here, the next thing that I know that I need is I need anything to the right of this 1, the next non-zero entry, which is here, this needs to be a 1. So what I can do then is I can just take that second row and multiply it by one half. So again, my first row I'm happy with, I'm just going to leave it. The second row, if I multiply by one half, I'm going to get one, three over two, nine over two. Third row, I'm going to stay the same. Okay, so doing a check here. First column, I'm happy, or first row rather, I'm happy with. Second row, I'm happy with. Again, because I have these ones, I have a zero here. That's all good. So now if I'm looking to my third row, what I'm unhappy with. This right here needs to be a zero. And so what I can do is I can take my second row and multiply it by three and add it to the third row. 
So first row stays the same. Now, if I multiply my second row by three and add it to my third, I'm gonna get zero, zero. I'm multiplying it by three, adding it to one. So I get 11 over two. And then I end up with 55 over two here. Okay, so we're almost done. Remember, we want ones on the diagonal, which we don't have, so the last thing that we need is to handle this 11 over two. That 11 over two, we need that to be a one. So what we can do is we can take row three and multiply it by two over 11. And unfortunately, I didn't give myself a ton of room. Hopefully you have a little more room. So we have one, two, negative one, negative one. We have our zero, one, three over two, nine over two. And then if I multiply by that two over 11, I get zero, zero, one. And it ends up being nice, that ends up being a five. So let's just stop right now and do a little bit of a check-in. Wanna make sure we understand what we just did. We did Gaussian elimination, and the form that our matrix is currently in is called row echelon form. So as a reminder, row echelon form is gonna have ones on the diagonals, or at least each one is gonna to be to the right of the previous one. We're gonna have zeros on the left side. So notice the bottom row, we don't have all zeros, which is fine. In the example I showed us, the bottom row was all zeros. We don't need all zeros. What we do need at least is our one has to be to the right of the previous one. And so now we need to make sure that we understand how to actually interpret all of this information. If we think back to how we set our matrix up, so all the way in the beginning, we took our coefficients on x, y, and z, and set equal to some number. So we're gonna set this up the exact same way, x, y, z, equal to some number. So this first row then tells us that one x add two y subtract z is equal to negative one. Our second tells us that one y add three over two z is equal to 9 over 2, and that last row tells us that 1z is equal to 5. So this now, we can see, is significantly easier to solve. We already have that z is equal to 5. Then if we go back, substitute that into our second equation, we have y add 15 over 2 is equal to 9 over 2, which tells us that y is equal to negative 3. And then if we go to our very first equation, so we get x subtract 6, Subtract 5 is equal to negative 1, which tells us that x is equal to 10. So we have now accomplished part A of this question. So we have solved by Gaussian, and we have a solution of 10, negative 3, 5. Now we are going to go on to part B of this question. Part B, we are solving by Gauss-Jordan. Now, we are not going all the way back to the beginning. We are going to uh, go back to this matrix where we left off. So I'm going to move us a little bit. Now we are going to do our Gauss-Jordan. This is the one which, which is going to get our matrix into reduced row echelon form. Those of us who've solved systems using matrices on the calculator, it's our RREF. So that matrix in green that we have above, the one, two, negative one, augmented with negative one, and then we have zero, one, three over two, nine over two, zero, zero, one, and five. So what we are doing when we get into reduced row echelon form is we are looking for ones on the diagonal, which we already have, and then we are looking for zeros everywhere else. So the issue that we need to deal with right now is this part right here. We need all three of those to be zeros. Okay, so first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus on this two that I wanna get rid of. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that second row and I'm gonna multiply it by negative two and I'm gonna add it to the first row. So my second row stays the same and my last row stays the same my first row then, I'm going to end up with a zero here, 
a negative 4, and a negative 10. Okay, so now we only have two numbers that we need to keep track of. So hopefully you recognize at this point the reason I dealt with that 2 first is now I can deal with this negative 4 and this 3 over 2 at the same time. I need both of those to be 0. And the, reason, the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use this third row. So what I'm going to do is to get rid of the negative 4 in the first row is I'm going to take my third row and multiply by 4 and add it to the first row. So if I do that first, I'm going to notice I get 1, 0, 0, 10. And again, the last row, I'm just keeping the same. Now, if I next want to deal with this 3 over 2, I'm going to take that third row, multiply it by negative 3 over 2, and add it to the first row. So when I do that, I'll get 0, 1, 0, negative 3. So now we are in reduced row echelon form. Again, because we have 1s on the diagonal, zeros everywhere else. And now, when we've seen this before, we can just read the solution right here. We get a solution of 10, negative 3, 5. So this was solving the system using Gauss-Jordan elimination. So a quick note here. You would never do both processes. I just want you to see the two processes and see the difference between them. As you can see, this is a long process. And if you make one mistake early on, uh, you're really going to be in trouble. There's obviously many different ways to go about this. You're definitely not going to be doing exactly the same operations that I am, which is fine, but we all should obviously get to the same answer. Now, before we add on to this, I definitely think we're going to need to do another example. So let's move on. Here is our uh, second example of this process, example number seven of the video altogether. I would suggest that you pause and try this one on your own. So if you feel up to it, Pause, try this one on your own, and come back when you're ready. If you are not up for it, then just keep sticking with me. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write this in, in an augmented matrix. So I have 2, negative 3, 1, 13. I have 1, 4, 2, 3, 3, 1, negative 3, negative 14. Like before, I notice conveniently I have a 1 here. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to switch rows 1 and 2. So that gives me 1, 4, 2, 2, negative 3, 1, 3, 1, negative 3. And then I'll have 13, 3, negative 14. Okay, so at this point, if I'm doing a little check here, I have 1, which I want. I need to get rid of the 2. I need to get rid of the 3. So I'm going to do those both at the same time. The way I can do that is if I take row 1 and multiply it by negative 2 and add it to row 2, this 2 then should become a 0. So my first row I'm going to keep the same. If I multiply that first row by negative 2 and add it to the second row, I'll get 0, negative 11, negative 3, and 7. Now to get rid of this 3 in the bottom row, I'm going to take that first row, multiply by negative 3, and add it to the third row. And when I do that, I'm going to get 0, negative 11, negative 9, and negative 23. Okay, so I have a 1 here, I have a 0, and I have a 0, so that's good. Next thing I would normally do is get a 1 here. Now what I notice that's convenient though, is I have these two different negative 11s. And so what I can do is now get rid of this negative 11 and make it a 0. If I take the opposite of the second row and add it to the third row. So I'm going to leave the first row alone. I'm going to leave the second one alone for right now. And then if I take the opposite of the second row and add it to the first row, I'm going to get 0, 0, negative 6, negative 30. Okay, so now doing a check-in again, if I'm doing, I didn't say this before, but I'm going to start like we did with the previous example with Gaussian. I have a 1 here, I have 0, 0, I need this to be a 1, and I need this to be a 1. So maybe making it a little bit clearer, I want these to be 1s. So the way I can do that is if I take row 2 and multiply it by negative 1 over 11, and I take row 3 and multiply it by negative 1 sixth, then I'll have my 1, 4, 2, 13, 
and I'll have 0, 1, 3 over 11, negative 7 over 11, and then 0, 0, 1, and 5. Okay, so finally, we've done all of this work that we can now solve. If I start on the bottom row, I see that z equals 5. If I go to the middle row, I see that y add 3 over 11 times z is equal to negative 7 over 11. So that gives me y is equal to negative 2. And then if I go to that very first row, I'm going to have x add 4 times y add 2 times z is equal to 13, which gives me x equals 1. So my solution is 1, negative 2, 5. So if you tried this one, great job. Hopefully you got to this answer. If you didn't, hopefully you were able to take a few steps in the right direction. If you didn't try this one on your own, that's okay. That's fine. Uh, hopefully this will give us a little more confidence that we could try it next time. Now, at this point, I do want to take those few extra steps for Gauss-Jordan to get us in reduced row echelon form. And so we're going to start with that blue matrix where we left off. So that is our 1, 4, 2, 3, 0, 1, 3 over 11, negative 7 over 11, 0, 0, 1, and 5. So the first thing that I'm going to deal with is this 4. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take negative 4 times the second row, and I'm going to add it to the first row. So my second row is going to stay the same. Last row is in the form that we wanted in, so the last row is fine. If I take negative 4 times the second row and add it to the first one, I'm going to get 1, 0, 10 over 11, and 61 over 11. Okay, and now what I need to deal with, I need this to be a zero and this to be a zero. And so the way that I'm going to do that is by using the third row. So I'm going to take that third row and multiply it by negative 10 over 11 and add it to the first row. Likewise, I'm going to take that third row and add it to negative 3 over 11, or multiply it by negative 3 over 11, and I'm going to add it to the second row. So when I do all of that, I'm going to end up with 1, 0, 0, and then a 1. 0, 1, 0, and a negative 2, and of course, my last row is unchanged. So this is now in reduced row echelon form because we have 1s on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else, and we like this form because it is super easy to read, and we see that our solution is 1, negative 2, 5. Now, of course, that's not a shock because we already saw that. Okay, so where all of this is leading us to is the last portion of the video. In the last portion of the video, we're going to be using this process to find something called eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So let's move on. Okay, so last thing we can see in objective five is we're using Gaussian and Gauss-Jordan elimination to find what we call eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Let A be a square n by n matrix. Then we say that a number lambda is an eigenvalue of A if there exists a non-value, a non-zero solution vector k of the linear system a times k is equal to lambda times k. That k is said to be an eigenvector corresponding to lambda. So let's take a look to see practically what that means in example 8. Verify that that k is an eigenvector of a. Okay, so if we look at the definition or above, this is what we're taking a look at. So we're going to need to verify that a multiplied by k is equal to lambda times k. So we are going to start with a times k. So that is our matrix 0, negative 1, negative 3, 2, 3, 3, negative 2, 1, 1 multiplied by 1, negative 1, 1. So if we multiply these two together, remember that you're always multiplying row by column, row by column, row by column. I'm not going to show us how to do all of that. I'm just going to tell us that the product ends up being negative 2, 2, negative 2. So the question for us then 
going back to this piece above, is is it possible to take that product and write it as some constant times k? Well, hopefully we can see that we can write that matrix as negative 2 times the matrix 1, negative 1, 1, which is negative 2 times k. So in this case, our lambda equals negative 2 is said to be an eigenvalue of a. Since that's our eigenvalue, we have thus verified that k is in fact an eigenvector. Before our next example, let's talk about where we're going with this. We're not going to need to verify eigenvectors or eigenvalues. What we're going to be doing in the rest of the video is finding the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, now that we know what they actually are. The reason that we're finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors is because moving on, we will be solving systems of differential equations. And so like we've done earlier in the video, we're going to be taking those systems and writing them as augmented matrices, which we will then solve using eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So that's just to get you, give you a little bit of a preview of where all of this is headed. So what we need to talk about now is how do we actually find an eigenvalue and an eigenvector? So using the definition that we wrote above, we know that a times our eigenvector is equal to our eigenvalue times k. So if we move everything to the same side, we have a times k subtract lambda times k is going to give us 0. So if we take that k, that eigenvector out, we have a subtract lambda times i. Okay, now we should be asking, well, why is there an i here? a is a matrix, lambda is a constant. So we can't take a matrix and subtract a constant. So we need to make this a matrix, hence why we have that i. So this is what we are trying to solve. Now the obvious solution to this would be if we made k 0. That's really trivial, though, or k is the 0 vector. That's trivial. We don't care about that solution. So instead, what we want is we want that a subtract lambda i to be to not be invertible. And here's why. If it was invertible, so if we could find the inverse of it, then we would be able to isolate k to get k to be the 0 vector. Well, we already said that that's trivial. That's not the one that we are interested in. OK, so this leads us to how do we know that a matrix is not invertible? Well, what that tells us is, for, is that that matrix a subtract lambda i, if it's not invertible, it's singular, which we talked about earlier which leads us to the determinant of that matrix, if the matrix is singular, has to be 0. This is incredibly important. This is the main idea of what we're going to be doing the rest of the video. So this leads to a polynomial in lambda. And the roots of that polynomial are eigenvalues. Then what we do is we solve taking a subtract lambda i, augmenting it with 0. And we have to do that for each of the eigenvalues. Okay, so going through this one more time, we need to ensure that a subtract lambda, lambda i is singular. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be setting up the determinant of this matrix a subtract lambda i is equal to zero. That's going to give us a polynomial that has lambda in it, which will allow us to solve for our eigenvalues. Then when we augment with zero, we'll get our eigenvectors. So let's jump in and take a look at an example. For example 9, we are finding the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a below. 
So one thing to note before we jump in, there's no way to look at this matrix and know how many eigenvectors we're going to get. Because it's three by three, we're going to get three eigenvalues. They might not be distinct though. So we might end up with three or two different eigenvalues, but one of them has a multiplicity of two. Okay, so what we need to take a look at is we are looking at the determinant of the matrix A subtract lambda I. So matrix A is three by three, which means we need to subtract from it a three by three matrix. So we have to picture taking lambda and multiplying it by the matrix where one is on the diagonals and zero is everywhere else. So if we set that up now, determinant of A subtract lambda I, we are taking the determinant of the matrix, one subtract lambda, two, one, negative six, neg positive six, sorry, negative one subtract lambda zero, negative one, negative two, and negative one subtract lambda. So we wanna set up this determinant. Now, because I notice that I have a zero in that third column, I'm gonna use this first column for my determinant. And so I'm gonna take one, and I have to picture taking away that row in that column, and I'm gonna end up with the matrix six, negative one, subtract lambda, negative one, negative two. I then have a zero, and then I have negative one, subtract lambda, times the determinant of the matrix, one, subtract lambda, two, six, negative one, subtract lambda. Okay, so what that gives me then, I have one multiplied by negative 12, subtract negative one, multiplied by negative one, subtract lambda. And then for the other matrix, I have negative one, subtract lambda, and that is multiplied by one, subtract lambda, negative one, subtract lambda, subtract 12. Unfortunately, this does not factor, so we're just gonna have to do some good old simplifying. First set of parentheses is going to become negative 12, add negative 1, subtract lambda. And then I have negative 1, subtract lambda. If I multiply out, I have negative 1, subtract lambda, add lambda, add lambda squared, subtract 12. So this gives me then negative 13, subtract lambda. And I still have to multiply out negative 1, subtract lambda and lambda squared subtract 13. So I get negative 13 subtract lambda, sub add negative lambda cubed, subtract lambda squared, add 13 lambda, add 13. Okay, so if we keep going, this simplifies down to negative lambda cubed, subtract lambda squared, add 12 lambda. So now if we remember, we want this matrix here to be singular, so we want its determinant to be zero. So what this takes us to then is we set this equal to zero, and at the same time I'm going to factor out a negative lambda, which leaves me with lambda squared, add lambda, subtract 12. So doing a little more factoring, I'm going to end up with lambda add 4 and lambda subtract 3. So finally we get eigenvalues of zero, negative four, three. Now, that is the first part of the problem. So the problem said find the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. So we now need to find the vectors associated with, with each of these eigenvalues. As a reminder, what we're gonna do then is we're gonna take a subtract lambda i for each of the lambda and we are gonna augment with zero. So I'm gonna start way fresh down at the bottom with the first eigenvector. So I'm gonna start with the eigenvector of zero. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a and I'm gonna subtract zero times i and I'm gonna augment with zero. So that is just the matrix one, two, one, six, negative one, zero, negative one, negative two, negative one, augmented with zero, zero, zero. Okay, and so now we're going to be doing some of those row operations that we did earlier in the video. So either uh, Gaussian or Gauss-Jordan, whatever you prefer. 
So I'm going to notice I have a one in the first row, so I like that. So my first row, I'm going to leave the same. I want to get rid of, though, this six and this negative one. So I'm going to take negative six times the first row and add it to the second row. I'm also going to take the first row and add it to the third row to get rid of that negative one. So when I do that, I end up with zero, negative 13, negative six. And I end up with, pretty conveniently, zeros in the bottom row. What I want next is I don't want this negative 13. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that second row and I'm going to multiply it by negative 1 over 13. So I'll have 1, 2, 1 with a 0. And I'll have 0, 1, 6 over 13 times 0 and then zero, zero, zero. Now, at this point, I can start rewriting my system and solving, or if I want it to be a little easier on myself, I'm gonna get rid of this two. And the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna take negative two times the second row and add it to the first row. So that second row is gonna stay the same. So that first row then, I'm going to get zero, 1, 0, and 1 over 13. Okay, so from here, we're looking for some eigenvector k, and let's say that it has three components, k1, k2, k3. If we take these two and write them as equations, we're going to get k1, add 1 over 13 k3 is equal to 0. And then we get k2, add 6 over 13, k3 is equal to 0. Now, hopefully we can tell you're not going to get a number right off the bat for k1, k2, and k3. We have three variables, but only two equations. So the best that we can do at this point is we can write k1 as a function of k3, and we can write k2 as a function of k3. So I can choose k3 then to be whatever I want. If I choose k3 to be negative 13, then that would give me an eigenvector of 1, 6, negative 13. Why did I choose negative 13? It's convenient. If I plug in negative 13 here, I'm going to get whole numbers for k1 and k2. So that is our first eigenvector, rather. We're going to have to do this process two more times for our two other eigenvalues. So let's go on to our second eigenvalue. Second eigenvalue is negative 4. So again, we're taking a and we're adding 4 times i, which remember just means 4 on the diagonals. So this vector will be 5, 2, 1, 6, 3, 0, negative 1, negative 2, 3, augmented with 0, 0, 0. So what I'm going to do is I want to switch rows 3 and 1 so that I end up with a 1 in the first row. And at the same time, though, I'm going to multiply by a negative 1 so that instead of negative 1, negative 2, 3, I just have 1, 2, negative 3. So I did kind of two steps in 1. Second row, I'm going to keep the same. And then I have 5, 2, 1. As we did last time, I want to get rid of this 6 and this 5. The way I'm going to do that is take the first row and multiply by negative 6, add it to the second row, take the first row, multiply by negative 5, and add it to the third row. So first row is going to stay the same. Second row then will become 0, negative 9, negative 18, and I have 0, negative 8, negative 16. Okay, so what I'm going to do then is just to make my numbers a little bit kinder, that second row, I'm going to multiply by negative 1 ninth, and that third row, I'm going to multiply by negative 1 eighth. So that'll give me 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. First row stays the same. Okay, so what I can do then is I can take the opposite of the second row, add it to the third row, Really, I'm just subtracting them.
And last thing that I want to do is get rid of this 2 right here. The way I do that is take the second row, multiply it by negative 2, and add it to the first row. So when I do that, I get 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, negative 2, 0, 0, 0. And now we're ready to write this in equations. So remember, we're thinking of this like K1, K2, K3. So that first row will give me K1 add K3 is equal to 0. And I get K2 subtract 2 K3 is equal to 0. So K1 then is negative K3. And K2 is 2 K3. So I'm going to let K3 be 1 because that'll be convenient for me. My k then ends up being negative 1, 2, 1. So that is our second eigenvector. At this point, we have one more eigenvector to consider, or one more eigenvalue, which will give us another eigenvector. So our third eigenvalue was 3. So again, we're going to take a and subtract 3i. So that's just 3 on the diagonals. So that gives us negative 2, 2, 1, 6, negative 4, 0, negative 1, negative 2, negative 4, augmented with 0, 0, 0. Now maybe you want to try this one on your own. If you're confident that you might be able to do a few row operations and solve, then try it. Is it hard? Yes. Is it going to take you a few minutes? Yes. But still, give it a try. Okay, so what I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to again switch rows 3 and 1 and multiply by a negative so that I end up with 1, 2, 4. And this will be negative 2, 2, 1, 6, negative 4, 0. Next thing I'm going to do is focus on getting rid of the 6 and the negative 2. So I'm going to multiply the first row by negative 6 and add it to the second row. I'm going to take the first row, multiply it by 2, and add it to the third row. So my first row stays the same. And then in my second row, I'm going to get 0, negative 16, negative 24, and 0, 6, 9. So then, so that I can end up with 1 here and here, I'm going to take that second row and multiply by negative 1 over 16. I'm going to take that third row and multiply by 1 over 6. So I still have 1, 2, 4, 0, 0, 0. So that will give me 0, 1, 3 over 2, and 0, 1, 3 over 2 again. I'm going to take the opposite of the second row and add it to the third row, so that my third row just becomes zeros. And last thing we talked about, I want to get rid of this 2. The way we're going to do that is I'm going to take the opposite of the second row and add it to the first row. So when I do that, I get 1, 0, 1. And then I still have that 0, 1, 3 over 2, and 0, 0, 0. So what this gives me then is K1 add K3 is equal to 0. And K2 add 3 over 2 K3 is equal to 0. So I get K1 then is equal to negative K3. And I get k2 is negative 3 over 2 times k3. And I can choose whatever I want for k3. If I let k3 be negative 2, then my eigenvector will become 2, 3, negative 2. So finally, that whole process, where that got us, is that our eigenvalues were 0, negative 4, and 3. And our eigenvectors were the vectors 1, 6, negative 13, negative 1, 2, 1, and 2, 3, negative 2. So all of this is the answer to the initial question, finding the eigenvalues, finding the eigenvectors. At this point, you're probably thinking, that was a long process. Why do I care about these values? At this point, you don't. We're not going to be able to use them yet. But in the next video, we will. This is for sure a tough process that I definitely think we need to try on our own. 
And so we have one more example that you're going to try. So here is our last example. We are finding the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of A below. So please pause this. Set up your determinant, set it equal to zero, and see if you can find those eigenvectors, eigenvalues rather. When you're ready, come back and then see if you can do the eigenvectors. I'm confident. Give it a try yourself. Okay, so I hope you actually tried it. Remember what we're starting with is we're taking A, we're subtracting lambda on the diagonals, and we're setting that determinant equal to zero. So we're looking for nine subtract lambda, nine subtract lambda, nine subtract lambda. And then we have one, 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 one. And that is our determinant and we need it to be set equal to zero. So if we go further with that, we get nine subtract lambda and that is multiplied by nine, nine subtract lambda squared subtract one. From that, I'm subtracting 1 times 9 minus lambda subtract 1. And then I'm adding 1 times 1 subtract 9 subtract lambda. All of that has to be set equal to 0. So I'm going to continue down here. So I have 9 subtract lambda. And then in parentheses, if I multiply this out, it gives me lambda squared, add 18 lambda, add 80. This next one then I'm subtracting 8 subtract lambda and then lastly I have negative 8 add lambda and all of that is equal to 0. Again unfortunately this does not factor so we're gonna have to start multiplying some things out. So I have negative lambda cubed add 27 lambda squared subtract 242 lambda, add 720, subtract 8, add lambda, subtract 8, add lambda. So what that gives me then, if I divide everything by a negative, I get lambda cubed, subtract 27 lambda squared, add 240 lambda, subtract 704 is equal to zero. Okay, this is what you need to solve. You are not going to have a calculator on this. And so you're just going to need to take some, some good guesses as to what you think might an eigenvalue might be. So what I see is I see this 8 minus lambda, and I see another 8 with lambda, and I also see a 9. And so those gives me the suggestions that maybe 8 or 9 would be good to try. I'm going to see if 8 is a root by doing some sy synthetic division. So I'm going to take all of these constants, so I have 1, negative 27, 240, and negative 704. And I'm going to do my synthetic division, which means I'm lucky that I did, in fact, pick the right route. Now, of course, I did this before coming to do this video with you guys, so I knew that 8 was the route. If you need to pull out a calculator to do a little guessing and checking, that's fine. I don't expect us to do synthetic division over and over and over again to find roots. Okay, so where this leaves us, we have lambda subtract 8, and then we have lambda squared subtract 19 lambda, add 88 is equal to 0. Doing some more factoring, we get lambda subtract 8. I have lambda subtract 8, lambda subtract 11 equals 0. So what that gets us then is we have eigenvectors of 8 and 11. Now, remember I said 3 by 3 matrix, we're going to get three eigenvalues. They might not be distinct, though. So that 8 has a multiplicity of 2. So at this point, now that we have our eigen Ooh, eigenvalues. I didn't mean to write eigenvectors. Now that we have our eigenvalues, we are ready to find our eigenvectors. I'm going to start with that 11 since it has a multiplicity of 1. So my first eigenvalue is 11. So again, I'm taking a and I'm subtracting 11i and augmenting with 0. So I'm subtracting 11 on the diagonals. So that gives me negative 2, 1, 1, 
1, negative 2, 1, 1, 1, negative 2, augmented with 0, 0, 0. Of course, first thing I'm going to do is switch rows 1 and 3. So I have 1, 1, negative 2, 1, negative 2, 1, negative 2, 1, 1, augmented with zeros. I want to get rid of this 1 and this negative 2. So I'm going to take the opposite of the first row and add it to the second row. I'm going to take 2 times the first row and add it to the third row. And when I do that, I get 1, 1, negative 2, 0, negative 3, 3, 0, 3, negative 3, 0, 0, 0. I'm going to do two steps in one. We know that if we add the second row and the third row, that that third row will become 0. And we also know that we want a 1 here. So I'm going to take negative 1 third and multiply it to the second row. So I end up with 1, 1, negative 2, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, 0, 0. Lastly, I want to get rid of this 1 here. So I'm going to take the opposite of the second row and add it to the first row. So that will give me 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, 0, 0, augmented with 0, 0, 0. So I end up with then k1 is equal to k3 and k2 is equal to k3. So I can choose whatever I want for k3, but I end up with an eigenvector of just 1, 1, 1. Or 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3. All three of the elements should be the same. Okay, so now let's move on to our second and third eigenvalue, which are the same, which is our 8. So this gives me 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, augmented with 0, 0, 0. Hopefully we can see after our elementary row operations, we just end up with a single row of 1s. So that gives us the equation then k1 add k2 add k3 is equal to 0. So this means that k2 and k3 are independent. So I'm going to have to choose two different options. The first one logically is if I don't use k3, but I use k2. So if I do that, I'm going to get an eigenvector of negative 1, 1, 0. Then if I make k2, 0, and k3, 1, that'll give me negative 1, 0, 1. So ultimately, we found our eigenvalues to be 8 and 11, and the eigenvectors to be 1, 1, 1, negative 1, 1, 0, and negative 1, 0, 1. So if you tried that one on your own, that's great. I'm very proud of you for trying it on your own. If you didn't, that's okay. Hopefully you now have the skills that you can do the next one on your own. What I want to note here, though, is we had this eigenvalue of multiplicity 2, which gave us two eigenvectors. That's not always going to be the case. So write yourself a quick note that an eigenvalue with a multiplicity of 2 does not always give two eigenvectors. Sometimes you might just get one. Okay, this was a super long video. I hope that it reviewed some things maybe that were in the back of your brain and probably taught you some new things. Next video, we're actually going to be putting this into play with differential equations. So we're going to take, like I said, a system of differential equations, write them as a matrix, and find a solution using eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Until next time, thank you for watching.